Alrighty, so congestive heart failure. The first thing you need to know about congestive heart failure is that it's a it's an overall term. Okay, so if uh, the cardiomyopathies was an overall term that uh, included the uh, hypertrophic, uh, dilated, and restrictive cardiomyopathies, congestive heart failure can be referring to any or all of those. Okay, so congestive heart failure simply means, like it says here, the decreased pumping ability of the heart to meet the demands of tissue, okay? So when, when you talk about somebody who's in congestive heart failure, typically what you mean is that uh, their heart is failing, and again, it could be any of the reasons that we previously discussed. Um, it could be left side, it could be right side, it could be systolic, diastolic, it, it, any of those, plus obviously the cardiomyopathies that we specifically talked about. It just means it's been happening over a long period of time. So typically, um, cardi uh, congestive heart failure patients are measured and tracked over time through that ejection fraction, okay? So if you remember the ejection fraction from uh, prior anatomy and physiology classes, what it was talking about is that every time that left ventricle contracts, um, how much blood does it actually get out of it that was in there in the first place, okay? So how much blood goes from the left ventricle into the aorta and therefore to the rest of the body every time that left ventricle contracts? That percent is what we call the ejection fraction. Normally, if somebody's just sitting there minding their own business at rest, you know, fairly healthy, that sort of thing, um, their ejection fraction is going to be, you know, a little over half um, of, the, uh, of the blood that's in there. So, you know, I don't know what the books say right offhand, probably depends on the book, but uh, I'm going to say 52 to 58 percent would probably be considered completely normal. Okay, obviously if you're exercising, it can shoot way up, you know, the percent of blood you get out of there. Um, but as somebody ends up having the, uh, uh, being diagnosed with congestive heart failure, then you start seeing that drop below 50 percent for sure. And then it kind of goes in stages, you know, maybe they're, you know, get diagnosed at 40% ejection fraction, and then, you know, they can check in and they check in and they check in and you can kind of see it going down, 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 and now they're at 25%. And, and that's when people really start taking it seriously because now they're, um, you know, they're, they're in uh, trouble and at risk for, uh, well, not making it for very much longer. Uh, that's, in fact, when people start to need to do things like walk around and get those uh, muscles squishing the veins in their legs so that they can get the blood back into their heart so that they don't end up with, you know, severe edema and, and put more pressure on the heart. So you have that, uh, that typical um, scenario that happens as, as the ejection fraction goes down. But as you can see, that's, that's one of the ways that we do measure it is uh, congestive heart failure is their ejection fraction. And one of the ways that you can measure that, of course, is the echocardiogram, where you basically uh, look at the, the image, the live image of a, uh, it's like an ultrasound, cardiac ultrasound, sure. Uh, like an image of the blood um, being squished um, every time you have a systole, every time you have a diastole, then, then you can see it and you can actually see the blood getting squished and the, the computer will figure out what percent of that is and that sort of thing. And, and that gives somebody a, an ejection fraction and uh, obviously they want to keep it tracked. Um, congestive heart failure, of course, uh, one of the reasons other than the cardiomyopathies is, is you know, atherosclerosis. So atherosclerosis, which can lead to coronary artery disease, that is... Um, when you get the plaque buildup. So if you hear about plaque buildups um, in arteries, it's atherosclerosis, and uh, it obviously cuts down on the blood flow and causes ischemia and hypoxia, and um, certainly one of the major causes of cardiovascular disease in the United States. And uh, cardiovascular disease, I believe, is still the number one cause of death in the United States. So clearly something that is, is very important for you to understand, especially the concepts um, at this part of your undergraduate career. Um, like I said before, you can, all of these things we kind of talked about at one point, we certainly talked about hypertension and how it could possibly cause cardiac um, hypertrophy and the uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. We talked about the valve disorders in the earlier videos, and maybe some of those have something to do with, you know, a mechanical valve, or maybe it has to do with a strep infection that went bad. Um, arrhythmia simply just means some kind of abnormal heart rate, which you're gonna see in pretty much all of these. 
um, anemias. Uh, we certainly spent a few days, I think, talking about anemias at some point. And uh, clearly, if uh, somebody's having a long-term or chronic anemia, then that's going to seriously affect their blood flow. It's going to affect their oxygen and nutrient delivery and uh, can certainly lead to a, a bad heart. Um, you would think that would be a fairly easy thing to fix, but not always. Okay, so um, that is one of the things that kind of happens. And obviously, post myocardial infarction, they're going to have a, a much higher risk of having congestive heart failure after that because things die and, and it throws off the electrical conductivity. And then it's kind of chasing it down a rabbit hole with a cardiologist, which obviously anybody in congestive heart failure should be being tracked by an actual board certified cardiologist. Okay, so again, like always, signs and symptoms of congestive heart failure, they better make sense, okay? The heart is not pumping as well. You're not delivering oxygen to all sorts of places in the body. You're getting a backflow of the blood into the lungs. Um, you know, you're having difficulty breathing because of that. Uh, you're kicking out or spitting out or coughing up pink, pink frothy sputum. You're getting edema, um, especially with congestive heart failure. Unless you're talking about the right side, your edema is probably going to be more in your extremities, like your legs and your feet and that sort of thing. And I'll talk about right-sided congestive heart failure or right-sided um, um, heart failure in a second here. That has its own special little name. Um, and I, I guess why not? Now's a, a pretty good time to do that. So we'll go ahead and talk about that. Uh, core pulmonale is what they call that. So if you look at this, I put core pulmonale. Even though I'm talking about right heart failure, right-sided heart failure, I put it on the slide with the big lungs in the background because, of course, we know that the heart is in the middle here. And when you end up having the right-sided heart failure or right-sided congestive heart failure or whatever you want to call it, you need to go back to what caused this in the first place. Some kind of chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, okay, possibly cystic fibrosis or some kind of fibrotic lung disorder like getting silicone or something stuck in there or coal miner's lung or something like that. But I'm going to say the vast majority of the time we're talking about chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, which includes things like chronic bronchitis, where the bronchi are chronically inflamed to the point where the uh, lungs start making more goblet cells to produce more mucus, and then that becomes a problem because now they have chronically inflamed lungs and or bronchi, and they have too much mucus, which kind of a, is a downhill battle um, with that. Uh, emphysema is another COPD. Emphysema is the one, if you remember from earlier classes, where you are losing the alveoli. Um, the alveoli is that little uh, air pockets or air grapes, a bunch of grapes at the end of the entire system where you're actually doing the oxygen and carbon dioxide exchange between the blood and the lungs. And uh, technically, asthma is actually considered a chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, although typically we will just say asthma if that's what we mean, but um, it is also a, a chronic uh, disease that uh, makes it difficult for people to breathe. And if it's bad enough over a long enough period of time, it could also be causing core pulmonale. Okay, so again, what is core pulmonale? Let's go back to um, our little heart and again, throw it right smack in the middle of the lungs and think about it and you have your little your little heart here and basically the problem is going to be in the right ventricle mainly okay so as you know um, if you are leaving the left ventricle you know maybe your your blood pressure is 120 millimeters of mercury and going to the rest of the body well, by the time it's coming back and dropping into that right atrium you know we're talking very low blood pressure definitely you know less than 10 millimeters of mercury um, and that's normal okay well if you have something that is, uh, you know, in the category of core pulmonale, what happens is if your blood is trying to get back into your, you know, right atrium, into the right ventricle, and then go out that pulmonary artery to the lungs, and the lungs has a problem, a chronic obstructive disease or something that's causing a higher pressure, you're going to get a back pressure. You're going to get an afterload, and that is going to make it so that now the right side of the heart is going to have to respond by maybe it gets thicker, right? So now we have like a right-sided cardiomyopathy, um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and as we know, that's gonna decrease the amount of blood flow, it's gonna cause a lot more weakness in it, and now we're causing back pressures going this way. Well, one of the things that we can see with uh, chronic 
uh, corporal manel that leads to the right sided heart failure is you can actually see that backflow and how it affects things like the jugular vein. So you get jugular vein distension or it starts filling up with all of the uh, blood that's trying to get back in the right side of the heart, but it can't really do it because now you have all this back pressure system going back there and you get jugular vein distension. You can actually see that in somebody's neck. Okay, so that's one of the big uh, key points. Um, also, you would typically see ascites pretty much for the same kind of reason as you have the backflow back into the venous system and um, ascites, as we know, is edema, but in the uh, peritoneal space in the abdominal cavity. So um, you can see again where you know, you would, you're, you're backing blood flow up throughout the, the uh, venous system of the body and you can kind of see that uh, manifest itself by getting a lot of blood pooling in the jugular veins and and in those big portal veins and then dropping it into the uh, abdominal cavity as ascites. So uh, hopefully that is, is fairly clear. Um, that's pretty much about all I have on, on these subjects. And then we'll uh, make sure that you kick into the uh, next videos for the other topics on thyroid and such. Thanks.